Thank you, Vishal, for the kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Dr. Bansi Sabu sir, and my dear friends, Dr. Rutul and Dr. Dharmendra, for inviting me. So today, I'll be discussing about the OS chase in the GDM. Almost most of the part has been covered during the conference. So we know that not all things are in black or white. Some things lie in the gray area. So this topic lies in the gray area. It is slightly controversial, but what I'll do over the 10, 15 minutes is try to put things either in the black or the white area. So this is very important. We all know that some drugs are teratogenic, but Norbert Frankel, he coined the term fuel mediated teratogenesis. And I want everyone to get this term imprinted because glucose is teratogenic. Excess fuel in the form of glucose is harmful to the mother and to the baby. And just to uh, you know make the point more impactful, these are the pictures of two rat fetuses. One is non-diabetic, other is from the diabetic mother. And as you can see, uh, is this working? Anyways, as you can see on the uh, diabetic uh, fetus, uh, the right side, the skeleton of the face and the eye is malformed. And same is in this. So excess glucose can impact the malformations. And we all know that insulin is the first line therapy. But what are the drawbacks of insulin therapy during the GDM? It is labor intensive, particularly in the context of the developing countries like ours. There are limited resources. We have poor logistics and poor literacy rate. So it becomes almost difficult for the healthcare professionals to explain to the patients to take the insulin properly, insulin injections properly. Also, there is a needle phobia. Patient has to take multiple daily injections. There is high risk of hypoglycemia, weight gain, and also a psychosocial stigma. So we are always looking for an option. Do we have any other option rather than the insulin injections? Most of our patients also ask us the same. So yes, we have, we have the OHAs and these are the advantages. It's ease of administrations, low cost, very important in our settings, better acceptance among our patients, better follow up and is with the treatment. Even in the remote areas where there are uh, the storage facilities are not proper, there also we can give them the OHAs. So, Basically, uh, this has been very well explained at the uh, session, the keynote session by Dr. Seshaya sir. The pathophysiology of GDM starts with insulin resistance. And by giving insulin, are we treating the insulin resistance? No. So do we have something which can target the insulin resistance? And yes, we have. So there are two OHAs which have been proved to be safe and effective in GDM. One is metformin, other is the glyburide or glibenclamide. So do we have the data for that? Are they safe? Are they effective in using uh, during the GDM? Does they have good efficacy? So this is the uh, you know top level systemic review and meta-analysis data which we have, which was done by Dr. Jaya Saxena and her colleagues. And we'll go point by point that comparing the OHAs versus the insulin during the GDMs, what are the results? So data on the fasting blood glucose levels. The average blood glucose were slightly lower in the insulin group as compared to the OHA, but the difference was not statistically significant. Again, this is about the postprandial glucose control. And in the largest study, the metformin in, place, uh, metformin in GDM trial, the postprandial glucose levels were slightly lower in the OHA group as compared to the insulin group. 
again what about the birth weight the birth weight although it was slightly lower in the studies using metformin slightly higher in the studies using gliburide but overall the significant was not statistically significant the difference was not statistically significant what about neonatal hypoglycemia and we all know gliburide or the glibenclamide and the insulin can cause neonatal hypoglycemia which was not seen with the metformin group and what's the reason for that we all know metformin does not cause the neonatal hypoglycemia and the overgrowth the reason is although it crosses the placental barrier it acts by improving the insulin sensitivity in the fetal peripheral tissue rather than promoting insulin secretion on the other hand gliburide it enters the fetus through the placenta and it leads to excess fetal insulin secretions so once the fetus is born without the nutritional supply from the mother high peripheral insulin can lead to neonatal hypoglycemia what about incidence for large for gestational age both group had same incidences no difference what about cesarean section rates both group same as you can see in the forest plotting also what about other neonatal outcomes whether it is admission to the nicu neonatal respiratory distress incidence of birth injuries incidence of small for gestational age incidence of preterm births or congenital anomalies all these neonatal out outcomes were similar in both the groups of ohas versus the insulin so very importantly maternal complications were higher in the insulin group particularly the maternal hypoglycemia it was almost 22% in the insulin group as compared to 8% in the oha group and gestational weight gain very importantly here we are talking about you know uh, weight uh, not much weight gain during the pregnancy because of the higher insulin resistance so metformin has the reduced ability to increase the total gestational weight gain as compared to insulin the reason is insulin promotes the uptake of glucose by adipose tissue which stimulates the reesterification of fatty acids into triglycerides in the adipose tissue and that leads to increase in the total weight gain metformin on the other hand it improves the blood glucose through increasing the uptake of glucose by tissues its utilization by skeletal muscle improving the insulin sensitivity and we know that excessive gestational weight gain may have adverse effects both on the mother and on the offspring what about patient preference and this is very straightforward majority of the patients they prefer ohas as compared to the insulin acceptability was higher because of the ease of administration in the oha group but this is very important the glycemic control failure was more in the metformin group as compared to the gliburide group so people on uh, the patients on metformin they were almost 2.1 times higher they required the insulin over the period of time rather than the gliburide group in monotherapy the gliburide was inferior in comparison with metformin monotherapy or insulin monotherapy again very important what about the long term follow up we all have the issues of long term follow up in the uh, offsprings so the two year follow up study they suggested that no difference in the central fat measures total fat mass or percent body fat but for in group they had uh, larger upper arm circumferences bigger biceps and larger subscapular skin folds perhaps it's suggesting a favorable pattern of fat distribution with less visceral fat when compared to insulin treated mothers so just to compare the metformin versus insulin the maternal metabolic outcomes they were reduced weight gain in the metformin group reduced hypoglycemia and reduced neonatal hypoglycemia about the fetal outcomes less likelihood of large for gestational age babies similar birth weight 
neonatal deaths, stillbirths, or NICU admissions were also similar in both the groups. About the pregnancy outcomes, potentially it reduced the pregnancy induced hypertension and hyper or preeclampsia. What about clemenclamide versus insulin? Maternal metabolic outcomes, they had reduced likelihood of treatment targets remaining unmet, which was higher in the metformin group. Fetal outcomes, similar for the LGA babies, NICU admissions and the mean birth weight. About the pregnancy outcomes was also similar for the PIH, cesarean sections or preeclampsia. So conclusion for the co uh, comparison, compared to insulin, metformin is associated with more favorable outcomes for the treatment of GDM. Clebenclamide appears less favorable than metformin in comparison to insulin. Further studies are needed for the long term because we have studied still two years for the long term effects on the babies. Uh, we need further studies. What about metformin versus gliburide? So as such, uh, the treatment targets are not met with metformin in the uh, almost uh, 2.1 times higher failure rate is there with the metformin as compared to glibenclamide. But the maternal weight gain and neonatal hypoglycemia are less in the metformin group. So what the guidelines suggest? Majority of the guidelines they suggest to use insulin as the first line therapy. It is only the nice guidelines which suggest that you can use metformin as the first line therapy and insulin as the second line therapy. So just to summarize, for women with GDM who are intolerant or refuse to use insulin, such as those with poor compliance with insulin injections or inability to afford the cost of insulin, metformin could be used as an alternative for women with GDM without any contraindications. What are those contraindications? It is not recommended for patients with hypertension, preeclampsia, placental insufficiency, fetal growth restrictions and acidosis. Metformin is recommended for women with GDM after 20 weeks who cannot maintain blood glucose in the target range through diet and exercise and the max dose is 2 grams per day which needs to be taken in distributed dose after food to prevent any gastric intolerance. So overall OHAs are safe and suitable for use in the management of GDM because of good glycemic control and similar maternal and perinatal outcomes compared with the insulin. They are patient friendly and convenient and do not require intensive education instruction at the time of initiation of therapy. With that, I would like to thank both of the chairpersons. Thank you for the patient listening.